Today, I have the pleasure to present architect and educator Mark Foster Gage, who will be presenting a series of ideas around his practice, and then reflect this in the recent production of his office in New York, Mark Foster Gage Architects. Mark will present for approximately an hour, um, and then we can have questions from the audience. Uh, in this will meet session, it would be a pretty intimate thing. Um, so I'm going to say two or three words regarding the, the framework of this, uh, of this activity. And then I'm going to, to present you formally, Mark. Okay. So um, forming architecture is one of the central aspects of the disciplinary practice that influences and involves culture in general in terms of the growing global impact that images have on society. How we see reality is often, if not always, a fiction constructed by someone else. Architecture plays and plays an important role within this matter, precisely because it is a discipline that operates through representation. The Institute of Architecture of Buenos Aires uh, invites you to a series of conversations and presentations around the problem of emergent form in order to be able to articulate contemporary modalities of representation. Philosophical conflicts regarding aesthetics and the cultural impact that speculative architectural practices propose as a possibility of imagining new worlds. The idea of emergence has changed radically over the last 10 or 20 years towards methodologies that delay authorship in a conventional sense and allows designers to rethink how they not only represent architecture, but also how they operate as artists. The rigorous simulation methodology, the mechanic procedures encouraged by computers in the late 90s evolved in the new techniques of design such as uh, coding, kit bashing, rigorous simulation methodologies, and recently AI. The work of Mark really operates within this problematic, always in the search for alternatives to how to we approach aesthetics and what we should think architecture really is. Mark Foster Gage is the principal of Mark Foster Gage Architects in New York City, as well as writer, design uh, contributor to CNN, and an associate professor at the Yale School of Architecture, where his academic focus is in relationship between aesthetics and design. At Yale, he has offered related courses continuously since 2001, in addition to holding multiple administrative and service positions, notably as an assistant dean from 2009 to 2019. For nearly two decades, Mark Foster Gage has designed projects for clients, including Lady Gaga, the, the Biden Harris presidential campaign, Intel Corporation, Google, Samsung, W Hotels, Mac Cosmetics, Diesel, HM, the Coachella Music Festival, and Vice Media. Gage's design work has been exhibited in venues such as the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Museum of Art Institute of Chicago, the Royal Gallery of Art in London, the National Gallery of Art in Osaka, Japan, the Hiroshima Museum of Contemporary Art, the Frax Center in Orleans, the France Mayer Museum in Mexico City, and, and the Venice, Beijing, and Prague Biennales. His design work has been featured in most major architectural publications, as well as the popular press, including locations such as Vogue, Newsweek, Fast Company, Wired, USA Today, The New York Times, The Beijing Times, The Spectator, New York Magazine, Harper's Bazaar, and Surface Magazine. Television coverage of his work has been produced for PBS, Fox, and MTV. Uh, Gage, thanks. Yeah, Gage has lectured widely on his design work, as well as his design contribution to the field of architecture and numerous universities, think tanks, museums, and other international institutions, including both TEL and INC conferences. A comprehensive monograph on Mark Foster Gage's work and writings titled Mark Foster Gage Projects and Provocations was published by Rizzoli Press in 2018 and includes a forward, uh, forward by a Robert A. M. Stern, and an afterword by Peter Eisenman. Gage is the author of multiple books, including Designing Social Equality, Architecture Aesthetics, and the Perception of Democracy, 
and as editor has published Aesthetic Equals Politics, New Discourses Across Art, Architecture and Philosophy, Aesthetic Theory, Essential Text for Architecture and Design, and Composite Surfaces and Software, High Performance Architecture, co-edited with Greg Lin. Gage is a graduate of uh, Yale University and the Uni University of Notre Dame, and he has recently uh, be a nominee for an architecture prize awarded by the American Academy of Arts and Letters. So thank you very much, Mark, from doing this. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. My pleasure. Well, great. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here. I always like uh, architectural organizations that are just like starting up around the world. So I think what you're doing is fantastic because I think the world needs, you know, a little bit more help in the way of architecture and education. So I think uh, universities can't do all the work. So I, you know, I appreciate the invitation and kind of applaud what you're, what you're after down there in Buenos Aires. So I'm in New York right now, not too far out of your own time zone. And I have a kind of a PowerPoint um, put together here that I'm going to go through some areas faster than others, spend a little bit more time on others, but I want to leave enough time to have a kind of more general conversation. But in order to do that, I think it's good to provide some like context on our on our work. So I'm going to start. One of the things I want to start by talking about is the global need for architecture. I came across this chart um, a couple of years ago, and it shows the kind of explosion in urban growth around the world. So in 2016, was the first year in human history where more people lived in cities and urban environments than in rural environments. And that's a pretty exciting thing because it means it's the first time in human history where more humans lived in architectural environments than in what we used to call maybe natural environments, which is also interesting because it may mean that living in architectural environments is the new natural environment for humanity. If more humans are living in architectural environments than not, it means that architectural environments are influencing our evolution more than uh, natural environments have been in our past. So here we are in 2022, 20, uh, halfway between 2020 and 2050, and you can see that over the next 30 years, we have to build enough architecture to house about 4 billion people, right? So that means it's a good time to be an architect and it means we have a lot to do. The problem I see is how we're building architecture today, which is a kind of, I mean, a kind of not only mass production, but I would call it mass design. And in general, I think it's producing fairly ugly cities, fairly unlivable cities, fairly inhumane cities. You live in one of the exceptions to the rule because Buenos Aires is rather beautiful, certain in, certainly in some areas that I've seen. Uh, I'm also in New York, which was a city built mostly in the 19th century. Uh, cities that have been built in the 20th century tend to be pretty, in my opinion, unlivable, in particular in the United States. And I want to show an example of a project that I think is really problematic and kind of points the way at the dominance of efficiency over a kind of humanity or efficiency over cultural value. You probably will have never seen this project before. It's called Munger Hall. And I believe it's, excuse me, a proposal for the University of California at uh, Davis. It's a uh, student housing. And it's a building that is one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, 12 stories tall or so that is intended to fit about 5,000 students. And I think this is probably the worst example we have to date of an interest in efficiency, really totally destroying any interest in architecture as adding to the quality of human life. Just to put this in context, I teach at Yale. This is an image of Yale in the lower uh, slide and Munger Hall, an image of the upper slide, they both house about 5,000 people, 5,000 students. So what used to take 100 years and hundreds of buildings to form a community is now being done all at once on the lowest possible budget with, I would say, pretty dramatic consequences for human life. This is one of the student suites at Munger Hall. You can see it's like a kitchen kind of dining area, and these are the rooms. 
The only problem is, is that the rooms don't have any windows. Uh, this is the floor plan of Munger Hall, and it's going forward with construction. It has a central corridor, these side corridors called houses, and then all the windows are at the end in these public rooms. So you can see the kind of astounding, I don't know, almost like punishing efficiency with which this building treats students and students that are, you know, by the way, paying tens of thousands of dollars a year to go to this university. And I worry that if we're going to build housing for 4 billion people that looks like this, humanity is going to be a very, very unhappy species. Uh, this is also almost the same floor plan as many of the prisons in the United States. And if it's okay to build like this, and we no longer have an interest in building in communities and cities, I think humanity stands to lose a lot in the next 30 years. Uh, not only in terms of beauty and cultural reality, but also our ability to tolerate one another. I, I recently took a motorcycle trip across the United States that took about three weeks. And this is what most of the United States looks like, which is to say not very hospitable. Um, I'm sure you have your own versions of this in Argentina, but our cities have become places that are entirely unfit for human life. They're great for automobile life, but not so great for human lives. We don't walk anymore. We don't uh, meet people anymore. We don't have common environments anymore. We basically don't have cities anymore, at least in the United States, with most of suburban sprawl. Most of our money is spent on what I would call, you know, the suburban version of this, which is to say an inhumane type of architectural production. And my interest in architecture, as was mentioned in the intro, really focuses on kind of cultural value, aesthetic value, um, questions about beauty. And in doing a lot of the theoretical work I do, I collaborate with and deal a lot in the world of philosophy. So one of the people I collaborate most frequently with is Graham Harmon, who is a philosopher most closely affiliated with the school of speculative realism in the world of philosophy and in particular a movement called object-oriented ontology and i just wanted to present a kind of a couple ideas about that one is excuse me one is that um an object like the hammer in the lower left uh is is something which we take for granted on day-to-day -day life so for instance i would imagine most of you are sitting in a chair but most of you haven't really looked at the, that chair, noticed the aesthetic qualities of that chair. You probably couldn't tell me much about how it was constructed just because it's not at the foreground of your attention. And Heidegger and Graham Harmon both say that when, when a tool or something that humans use uh, works uh, functionally, but only functionally, it becomes what they call a piece of invisible equipment with regards to human attention, which means that the chair you're using never comes to the foreground of your attention if it just behaves as a chair and just looks like a chair. One of the ways to get things to come to the foreground of your attention is to slightly estrange them. And that's the figure in the upper left, Victor Shlovsky, who talked about estrangement. And if you can make things estranged from their environment, you tend to notice them more. So my interest in architecture is doing things which don't necessarily demand your attention, but are slightly estranged from their environment, thereby causing them to come to the foreground of your attention. One of the ways to do that is to produce things maybe that don't look weird, but show up at a higher or lower resolution relative to what you're used to looking at. So this is an example of these two flowers shown at high and low resolution. And uh, what I'm going to talk about a little bit more over the next couple slides is this concept of res uh, resolution, that if you make an architecture that has a higher res resolution, that it tends to come to the foreground of human attention. And architects throughout history have found techniques to do this. The architects of Hellenistic antiquity in Greece had a, a series of procedures that they called optical refinements, which you may have studied about in your history class. 
but this is the Athenian Acropolis and this is the Parthenon and there isn't a straight line on the Parthenon. The entire building is bent. This is an exaggeration of the floor plate of the building, which is actually bent in two directions. And all of the columns on the building tilt with very precise and very, you know, kind of degree of precision and calibration that would be unfathomable in today's construction practices. So the end columns have closer spacing, the end columns lean in more, uh, the entire building is kind of pressed upwards. And all of these things were done to generate a type of aesthetic presence that estranges it from the context in which it's found, to make it more special or uh, more, uh, I would say, visually impactful. Even 400 years after the Greek, uh, uh, the, the Parthenon, Vitruvius, who writes the first book of architectural theory talks about a similar effect and he talks about how the human eye doesn't always work perfectly for instance when you look at a pencil in a glass of water it looks as if the pencil is broken and he attributed that to some fault in human perception and he gives all of these rules in architecture about how we're supposed to build these columns with certain proportions and certain measurements and mathematics and that you have to be very precise about the classical rules. But then he also says, but if something doesn't look right, you can throw out the rules and make it look right because that's what an architect's true job is, is to calibrate the visual impact of reality on the human mind. So architects, I would say, aren't in the business of just producing shelter. I would say we're in the business of calibrating what reality looks like to the human mind. And this is something the Greeks believed in. This is something Vitruvius and Roman architects believed in. This is something that Brunelleschi in the 15th century and uh, the very beginning of the Renaissance believed in. He was the architect who was responsible for the discovery of what was called horizon line isosophily, which is a form of perspective. He, in a sense, discovered or rediscovered how to draw things in perspective. And what perspective drawing really is, is how to draw something in representation in a way that predicts how it will look to the human eye. Again, calling on that idea that architects, as he was an architect, he was the architect of the Duomo uh, in Florence around 1419, when he did this famous experiment where he calculated how the eye works with perspective using a mirror, a painting of the baptistry, and calculating the lines of the baptistry. So this is the baptistry out front of the Duomo. And by figuring out how the human mind worked with perspective, he, in essence, kicked off the Renaissance, which was, as you know it, one of the most important architectural movements in human history. So if you look at these two images on the left, one of it is a drawing of a cylinder from the mid 1300s. And this is a perspective painting of Florence from the mid 1300s. And you can see the baptistry here. You can see how the buildings don't look real. You can tell they're buildings, but no effort is to give them any perspective because before the Renaissance and before the rediscovery of perspective, it wasn't human's job to understand what reality looked like. It was God's job to understand what reality looked like. And hum humanity uh, never attempted to show things in their true reality because that was the domain of God. That wasn't the domain of humanity. So after the Renaissance, this was a painting from our drawing from about 100 years later after the Renaissance rediscovery of perspective. And this is a drawing of Florence, same city as this. And you can see that it starts to have things like perspective. It starts to have things like foreshortening. It shows human life. It shows the context of the hills. It shows a representation that shows that humans are able to understand the world in which they live in. This is a drawing by Uccello from 1450, roughly. It's the world's first wireframe where he was trying to understand the geometry. So in 100 years, drawing and geometry went from this image on the left of these cylinders 
which really just show flat circles and lines connecting them with no effort to look real to only a hundred years later after the discovery of perspective uh, truly understanding how form appears to the eye and how to capture that form through geometry and perspective. It's an astounding leap in a hundred years of the faculties of humankind to draw, represent, and anticipate what construction would look like before it was actually built. And again, this was done by architects. Uccello was an artist and architect. Um, Brunelleschi was an architect. Alberti, who popularized some of these theories, was an architect and theorist. And so I try in my own, let's say our own time, to think about architecture's relationship with reality and how it's perceived. And the discipline and philosophy that we do that through is aesthetics. So a lot of my writing is about aesthetic theory, aesthetic, exception, uh, I'm sorry, architecture aesthetics and the perception of democracy, aesthetic equals politics, and then two works on my book, which have a lot of my work and writing. So I'm gonna start out by talking about some of the ways in which we estrange our work to get it behave to behave in an aesthetic way that comes to the foreground of human attention. That architecture isn't only about function, it isn't only about form versus function, it can't only be about efficiency, or we're gonna get a world that looks like this and this, which to me is terrifying. Um, so these are some projects where we started using technology as a way to estrange the relationship between architecture and its users and its viewers. These are various projects that used interactive technologies for H&M, the Coachella Music Festival, Intel Corporation, using a lot of interactivity. We did a project that used interactivity for Lady Gaga. This is a kind of a pop-up museum of her outfits uh, that was in Hong Kong, where you would approach the walls and they would kind of change color. These are all of her outfits. Um, we did a similar thing for a virtual reality uh, arcade in Manhattan, where through different lighting effects and projection, we changed the material and color and look of this space. So you put on virtual reality headset and you play a game, and by the time you take off the headset, the, com the environment has completely changed around you. So it's like entering a new world after every time you take off your headset a kind of architecture as a musical instrument that you can play. We did Nicola Formichetti's fa uh, fashion designer, his first store in New York, which attempted to blend the architecture and the faceted environment with this collection of his, also including a lot of Lady Gaga's outfits that were from her various videos. In an attempt, again, to kind of defamiliarize the relationship between architecture and fashion. So these are some photographs of that store, which was built. I know this looks a little bit like a rendering, but these are actual you know, lighting effects that were generated by the store with th thousands of these mirrored facets. We've also tried to ex uh, estrange the relationship between architecture and human perception by increasing the level of resolution. We did a number of ex experiments that I think were the first example of digital kit bashing in architecture. I may be wrong about this, but this was about eight years ago. Uh, and we started downloading objects from online and collecting them. And we made this little balcony just to see how much high level of detail we could get into architecture. Like what's the maximum architecture we're capable of designing in terms of high resolution. So this was an idea that I had been playing with in philosophy and we used architecture as a way to explore the idea. That doesn't mean that we wanted the whole world to look like this. It was a philosophical idea uh, explored through architecture. So our first project where we really attempted this was our Guggenheim Museum in uh, Helsinki, which was a proposal, obviously not built. I'm not sure we even really wanted it to be built, but this is the view you would see from far away. It was basically a collection of different objects we found online that we composed into this architectural structure that's about 12 stories tall with giant cantilevered edges. And 
the the effect was that we wanted you know to challenge people's preconceived notions of architecture of what architecture was and how detailed architecture could be and it worked because this is a lecture being given by the Pritzker Prize winning architect Arata Isozaki who some of you may be familiar with and he actually presented this project in one of his lectures and he wrote the words weird over the front which you can see here on the screen and I thought that was like a total smashing success uh, if Arata Isozaki is lecturing about your work and he calls it weird which is because he recognized that it wasn't there was something abnormal about this architecture which was entirely the purpose of the exercise was to extrain estrange architecture from its surroundings and the context of architecture that we all take for granted in a sense finding a way to get it to come to the foreground of your attention which it did in some capacity for him at the same time we were working with nicola formichetti on an outfit for lady gaga which we use the same strategy for, in a sense, kit bashing 3D masks of her fans. It turned out we weren't allowed to get the rights to her fans, so we just used her own face, 3D printed a bunch of her own faces, and this is her wearing her own face for a video called Viva Glam. And then we did these weird digital effects like having symmetrical wings. So she's wearing these three creepy 3D printed masks and an asymmetrical kind of bodice but then has these symmetrical wings. And that's all available to see online. Again, the video is called Viva Glam. We also do a lot of accessory design for a company called Nico Panda. Uh, also kit bashing these little panda shapes, which are the icon of the company. Kit bashing a lot of different materials, making little like panda bear sunglasses. These were sunglasses that were intended to make you look like a panda bear. These didn't go into production, but a lot of these other things did. A lot of it's still available on um, nicopanda.com or on amazon.com. Uh, we did a collaboration with Mac Cosmetics where we designed a lot of these uh, makeup items which were sold in the Mac Cosmetics stores around the world. So these are some of the pieces that went into that. Just doing things that are unexpected like not putting the logo on top of uh, the compact but actually pressing it into the makeup so that this is like white makeup and pink makeup and peach makeup and you blend them all together but the logo is inside the makeup itself we also take those ideas into product design this is a series of vases we designed for an art gallery uh right before covid this is in our old office our, our pre-covid office uh looking at exploring different materials different effects different colors so a lot of what we do is very tangible it's not all in the computer although it starts in the computer but these are some examples of some kit bashed projects which went into production these are all rotocast in different types of plastic uh, these are some of the finished product they're about 20 inches tall but you can see the high level of detail you get on them and they were sold through this gallery but just moving up in scale even for a project is kind of simple as a building in manhattan uh, which wasn't built, we were trying to use these higher and higher levels of detail. So if you can see, there's less detail at the bottom, more detail at the top. So this penthouse gets an extreme level of detail. And this was all cast concrete. So you would CNC mill uh, kind of foam, and then you would just cast the concrete into the foam. So this isn't all carved. It's actually concrete panels, or at least that's what was proposed to get a kind of, again, different level of resolution of detail in the architecture. This is about four blocks away from my apartment. So sad it wasn't built, but there you go. Uh, this was another project which used that strategy of kit bashing. But in this one, we started to abstract some of the elements. So in this one, you could tell what some of these individual objects were. In this one, a tower on 57th Street, we were really interested in getting high levels of detail, but making it so the elements weren't recognizable. We're also interested in fusing this project, a high level of detail with a, a kind of more common curtain wall system to see how we could get a kind of believable architecture to marry with this more, I would say, detailed and complex language. 
Uh, these are some of the renderings of that. About halfway up, it has these giant public balconies. You can see the mix of curtain wall with these cast uh, concrete pieces. The building is about actually about 60% curtain wall, uh, obviously 40% uh, concrete. Each of the floors has you know, very similar views, but some of them have these specialty balconies or specialty features like arches. We worked with a concept artist named Patrick Fallwetter to kind of design some of the entries and lobby spaces, which use some of that uh, similar language in a highly detailed way. Um, I have a quick video I'm going to show. Uh, there's no sound, so but it is about two or three minutes. But it's just going to show the detail from the very bottom of the project all the way to the top. So I'm just going to let it play out. So the goal really was to not repeat uh, formal moves, was to have every element of this skyscraper kind of appear unique. Um, but again, like I said before, you can see that it uses a lot of standard curtain wall. That isn't to say that it's you know entirely reasonable, but again, the goal was to generate a language that fuses this language we developed a couple years prior with something more standard from the architectural world of production. You can see like chairs and people in there for a sense of scale. And the building is a hundred stories, uh, which is actually common. A lot of these needle thin residential buildings are being built in New York City. So this would be like the fifth or sixth building of this height and proportion. Again, these balconies are about halfway up telling you that we're only halfway done with the video. So it's a good time maybe to go get a drink or go to the bathroom. Also for me to take a drink. So this was a speculative project. Uh, we had a client that actually commissioned us to do a smaller version of this. And through discussions with them, we were interested in imagining what like the skyscraper of the future would be in 30 or 40 years, you know, after after everyone got sick of cities full of glass boxes, how would we maybe return to something with a higher level of detail and intrigue that wasn't necessarily building, uh, you know, old fashioned architecture. Uh, can you still see my screen? Oops. Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, just to shift gears a little bit, we got asked by New York Magazine to imagine New York City in 2050. And one of the things that I've lived through living in New York City for 25 years is I've seen a lot of flooding. This is a flood map of the areas that will be flooded significantly by 2050. Uh, which represents a really large portion of New York City. But New York City has two rivers. One is the Hudson River on the left, and one is the East River, which is actually a tidal estuary, meaning that it changes direction according to the tide. But because it changes so much, it's much more prone to flooding, which is why most of the flooding in New York City is along this East River. This is LaGuardia Airport, which will be completely underwater by 2050. Uh, our solution was not to build walls, which is one of the proposals to build miles and miles of walls. We just pr proposed the very simple solution of putting a dam here and a dam here and just draining the river and making a fertile valley of parks and agriculture with these giant um, geothermal vents. So these are geothermal wells that power the city and exhaust up into this non-crowded area above this fertile valley this shows one of the dams i mean it seems like a pretty simple solution to me um we didn't get the contract but you know here's to hoping the van dams are uh the dam is occupiable the geothermal vents are actually these vertical parks so you would go into the structure and walk down a series of ramps and stairs to get to this public and agricultural land uh, down below with a series of waterfalls. This is a chunk from one of the vertical parks. So the idea is that 
you circulate around this vertical green space and go inside and outside of outdoor rooms. In the winter, there would just be a dribble of water when it's cold, so this would freeze into a giant ice sculpture that you kind of circulate around. But the idea of a public vertical park was something that really intrigued us, which is what all of these things were. Another project, completely different species, was for the Na uh, uh, Lithuanian Center for Science and Innovation which uses these fractal geometries to generate these really high resolution surfaces. If you can see, you know, the building far away has a particular identity. And then the closer you get, it has more and more detail. It's a little hard to see here, but the point is that the building has different levels of detail and perception, depending on how far away from it you are. So it's not, it's like the opposite of a glass curtain wall building, which is about abstraction. This is about, uh, subsequent layers of detail which are all placed in different locations on the building so this is the main entrance you see here a person scale figure as you get closer to the front door which is this tall narrow slot you get an extreme level of detail here uh, that you don't get from farther away once you walk into this uh, opening you're confronted with a very large very thin atrium this is about a seven story atrium where every other uh, floor gets this giant balcony overlooking the atrium. So this, again, is using a fractal language that was generated with mathematics software to generate, once again, a different, a different species of high-resolution architecture to kind of change our perception of what architecture might be uh, in the future. We've used that strategy on smaller projects. This is for a small private library in uh, England, which is going forward with construction. We've been working on it for about three years. It's going to be built in a different, a slightly different form than this with different materials. But this was our initial proposal uh, that uses, again, these higher levels of detail to produce this very small building, but with, I would say, like very large ambitions. So you can see the stair coming down between the exterior wall and an interior wall. The exterior wall would be stone and the interior wall would be metal. Uh, chair here just as a scale scale figure. Another house we did at the same time, which won't be built, was a guest house for a, um, an estate owner in the north of France. This was intended to be a kind of placed on his estate. So it's it was important to use as a guest house, not only to house guests, but as an, a, a, a beautiful part of his garden as a kind of folly to look at that was something that was sculptural and architectural, but in a different way than just doing architecture that looked like sculpture. This is architecture, again, that uses kind of these high resolution fractal forms. It's a very small building where you enter at the lower level, which just has a kitchen. You go up some stairs to a small living room and upstairs to a small bedroom with a small bathroom off to the side. And the windows are floor to ceiling glass with these cast concrete pieces that act as a rain screen and shading devices over parts of the structure. Another house with a kind of different strategy was for one in the kind of deep forest in Northern Canada, which we developed a very thick facade with the idea that plant growth would develop in these ridges. And we had these large bronze casing windows to encourage plant growth to car, uh, to crawl up and around the structure. So the idea was that the building would become a living ruin. It would look like this to begin with, but over the course of 30 or 40 years, it would develop this, this kind of relationship with the botanical context that made it an architectural, but functioning architectural ruin. So all the materials were chosen to be very long lived. Bronze is one of the longest living materials that humans can use. It would take millennia for bronze to break down and it doesn't rust. The same with this stone that we picked, which would have been a very thick panel, which would have taken you know millennia to start to break down. So a very robust house with the idea that it rot over a long period of time, uh, as opposed to the idea of architectural modernism, which you do a project, but then it requires you to maintain it at a very, very high level as you're cleaning glass constantly or changing uh, the paint on uh, metal panels 
uh, so that they don't rust. This was a kind of anti-modernism, which was intended to rot and decay. This is a view of the interior, which we wanted to appear like a cave, almost, a kind of Neolithic future architecture with plantings inside and water features, a small pool, uh, um, a kitchen. And then the last project I'm going to show here before we moved on to some questions and answers is a book called Architecture in High Resolution. And a couple of years ago before COVID, we were asked to design a, a desert resort in the Middle East. Uh, there were a series of competitions for these resorts. The only one that uh, is going to go ahead with construction is Jean Nouvelle's. So we were sad to lose, but happy to lose to Jean Nouvelle because he did a really great scheme. His scheme is inside the rocks. Our scheme was kind of embedded uh, and nestled into this rocky feature. The idea was that you would arrive to the site on a dune buggy because it's far from any roads. Um, and you would get these certain views at each one of these points. And then we wanted a way to make all of the rooms have a view out where you didn't see any other rooms. So all of these buildings are kind of nestled in these little crevices and cracks within the architecture with the idea that you would see out and have an unobstructed view but when you saw the architecture within the context it would add to the natural features not detract from them so this is the first view you would get of the resort from far away where it's nestled in this almost like a kind of mini valley valley where nothing is taller than the rocks and it really makes an effort to really embed itself within the context this shows a kind of aerial view that shows a core with this tower, which is actually a water filtration tower, kind of common pool, restaurant, spa, small oasis. This is the center circulation core. And one of the things we are interested in doing is keeping some elements of the site, like these large rocks. I'm very interested in using circulation as a way to see architecture and context from various different perspectives. So in our work, you never get a stair that just goes back and forth like you would in a kind of efficient modern building. Instead, you would enter, throw up this grand stair, come around and up through this pavilion, come up here, you know, walk to the other side of the complex over here. But the idea is that the circulation becomes a journey up in and around the architecture and context in a way that makes you more aware of the features of the building. So. It's also, um, you know, this is an idea that modernism really hated, that you would, you know, waste money and time on circulation. Uh, it's an idea that we really cherish in our work, that circulation becomes an aspect of architecture, which allows you to see both the world and the architecture with from much different viewpoints, with a much different set of eyes, as Proust would say. This is the other... Um, this, so this chunk is connected to this chunk by the pool. So this is just looking at the same area from two different angles. This has, um, again, a kind of, this is a uh, outdoor temperature pool. This is a chilled pool. This is a, a promenade with lounge chairs that you'll see an image of later. This is a kind of private massage suite. These are uh, elevators for handicap access. And you can see all of the, this uh, oasis is actually a water filtration uh, technology that uses plants in their roots to filter water down to this lower um, level of mechanical equipment. And for the fa facades in this project, we took a lot of the patterns from this region, like three millennia of different civilizations, and we extracted the patterns and started combining them in artificial intelligence to generate a language of architecture that wasn't from history, but used historic patterns in a new way to generate an architecture that is at the same time familiar in its historic references, but doesn't look like anything from throughout history. So using, in a sense, the world's most advanced technologies with the world's most ancient uh, patterns to develop this strange hybrid 
And so these are some of the kind of facade languages we developed. Um, then we took these patterns and made what we called like deep 2D. So each of these is an artificial intelligence facade that uses um, depth. So each of these is like two to three feet deep. So it wasn't just a graphic. It was actually something which had some thick architectural qualities. And we started to use those for some of the aspects of the building. So in this tower, which is a circulation tower, you get three different architectural languages. You get this kind of rusticated stone language. You get this um, vertical detailed language. And you get this really intricate AI language along with this glass uh, kind of fluted. So it's a, a collection of these languages that we're composing to create this kind of mini city environment. Very interested in that low resolution stone uncarved, uncut stone with a very high resolution facade happening on the same project. Um, this is a view of the kind of grand entrance showing the areas with, again, a high level of finish with a very rough level of finish with water features and planting. This, again, is the water filtration tower that just pumps water up into this cube and allows it to circulate through layers of sand and charcoal. So all of the water that's used in this resort is recyclable as uh, gray water. This is the view of that promenade and arcade <clears throat> that has the lounge chairs, a horizon pool. This is the actual view. I took this photograph with my own camera. So I actually know this is what you would see from this exact site. Some of the rooms are embedded into the rocky context. This is uh, again, the actual site you would see from this room, because I, I took the photograph. So the idea is that in the rooms, they become a little bit, the architecture disappears a little bit, and we try to let the context, either the nearby context with actual rocks or the uh, exterior context with faraway views kind of shine. There's different parts in the complex that are highly colored, like these prayer temples, which are this beautiful tiling patterns presented against this really monolithic desert. Uh, these are the canopies above the oasis. And these are just some of the forms which were used in some of the different structures that are kind of peppered around the site. Um, there's a lot of iterations we went through, which is why we're doing the book on the subject. This is the highest element on the site, which is an astronomy center. So at night, guests can kind of climb up to the top of this rock and uh, check out a telescope and you know look at the night sky because there's no cities within quite a distance so it's a very good place to view uh, stars and the desert gets quite cold at night so this facility both houses the equipment but also allows the guests to take a break and have coffee and hot chocolate and then go stargazing some more these are just some of the shapes, different towers and things that happened around the sites in different way with some of the rooms nestled into different cracks and crevices. This is a view of one of the studio rooms, uh, again, built in the kind of rock structure. And this is a 3D printed model. So this is 3D printed in solid brass uh, that we submitted, just that allowed us to capture some of the detail and some of the effects and how it all fits in together with the site. Uh, which is CNC milled foam. This is the main reception area entrance where you would get out of your dune buggy. And this is bent channel glass. So you would have the choice of entering on axis along these water pools into this reception building, or you could go into the air conditioned arcades where there would be like lounges off to the side, one side for VIP, one side for um, regular guests. And then the inside of that is, um, uh, again, uses one of these AI patterns with tile and inlaid metal. This is a scale figure of the receptionist to create this really beautiful, I think beautiful, you know, uh, chromatic, dense green um, environment that you would see after having been through the desert for it about an hour, having seen very, very little color. So it was intended to be a kind of relief for the eyes as well be, as being uh, just a kind of 
place to check into your room with skylights above it. And then I think the last image I have is of a type of domed ceiling we were working with that we're still kind of trying to tame, but it's look at using, looking at using like a historic language of coffering with the language of domes, with artificial intelligence to develop a new type of domed ceiling that is both domed and not domed simultaneously. So this is a language we're working on uh, for interiors and in some of our continuing projects, but it's kind of where our interest in high resolution is at the moment. It's generating not just high resolution two-dimensional forms, but really trying to get the, these to form in three-dimensional ways and using materials like iridescence that also kind of change uh, the appearance of the architecture depending how you look at it in different ways. So again, that's, I mean, that's the kind of body of research that I, I hope I'm producing is trying once again, like was done in Greek antiquity and Roman antiquity and the Renaissance is to keep architecture experimenting with how we use it to create the background of our reality and that our background of reality and the reality we live in is worthy of a higher degree of attention than we're currently giving it. So that is uh, my presentation in a nutshell, and I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Let me just close out of my sharing here. Stop presenting, all right. So, All right, great. Thank you, Mark, for that. Uh, lots of information. Um, I have some questions. Uh, if, if any anyone here want to ask, please, be my guest. Uh, maybe I can start. Sure. Um, um, you, you, in your presentations, and also in this one, you, you, you don't usually uh, present uh, present uh, plans, right? Like uh, you you don't present pictorial drawings of plans of your buildings, or, um, diagrams, or diagrams, or diagrams. You you usually use uh, perspectives, renderings, interiors, exteriors. Uh, maybe some axonometric drawing. If you, uh, also in those uh, in those chunks you you present. Yep. In the end. Um, I was wondering what is what is your position regarding organization in terms of relation with the ornament that you produce because you are very interesting in ornament. Um, I don't know if you can you can elaborate uh, if there is a relationship uh, intended uh, with organization. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so all of the projects that I showed, like. We do have we we do have you know plans and sections and elevations and but the theoretical argument on the table is one about aesthetics, which is one about human perception, which is always when I present my work either to clients or to students or at you know like kind of TED talks or whatever symposia I at I'm at we really focus heavily on what the architecture would look like in reality because the theoretical argument is about is about reality and in reality you don't perceive a plan you don't perceive a section those are tools that allow us to design architecture as reality so i'm actually very old-fashioned in that i hand draw and i spend a lot of time on plans and sections and elevations um, but we just don't show them because the force of the argument, and I think the force of the work is in its aesthetic impact. And we like the aesthetic impact to be through the building, not through the representation. So I know there's a kind of trend these days for architects to do, you know, really flat graphics with a lot of pastels and you make the work look like a painting done by a child. And that honestly, like rather infuriates me because I think it's infantilizing and I think it shows architecture, it, sh it shows that the architect can make a very nice painting, but it doesn't show the architectural qualities of the building itself. And I'm really interested in 
the architectural qualities of buildings and architecture themselves because I think the architectural qualities and aesthetic qualities of what we're producing now are really actually dangerous for the future of humanity. That we're producing inhumane environments that just produce like grumpy, lonely people. Uh, I, I, I've been to 80 countries around the world, including North Korea, Saudi Arabia, Uzbekistan, some very interesting places for the sole purpose of seeing how people live. And I can say with some confidence that the cities created in the United States in the 20th century under the influence of modernism and the automobile are some of the worst living environments on earth. I don't mean they're the poorest living environments on earth. I just mean they are some of the least humane environments on earth. They don't meet the needs, in my opinion, of humankind on either functional or cultural levels of meaning. So that's why all of our work really focuses on that aspect, not because other aspects aren't important, but that's just, that's what I'm bringing to the table in architecture, not new ideas about plans or section, but ideas about architecture is something which mediates between humans and reality, which is why when our buildings aren't built, which is most of the time, we try to present them as if they were. Right, well, it, it's interesting, the last image that you show of those uh, AI generated domes, like that's something different, right? That's something you're exploring right now that is, uh, that is working into, uh, maybe it's, it's a step into something different or a, a different methodology. Yeah, maybe it's a type of reality that's so complex it's hard to per perceive. Because that's actually just a perspective rendering, but it's very hard to wrap your head around it. And, you know, maybe there is a place in architecture where you get so much detail and complexity that the human mind isn't capable of perceiving it. And that is really interesting to me. Like, what does that mean? Because right now we have the opposite. We live in a world of boxes and a lot of glass boxes that people take no notice of, that they're just invisible to our attention, right? It's right. like we live in, you know, a world where food... If architecture were food, like then food wouldn't have any flavor. You would just be eating food without flavor. That's what our architecture is now. It's like flavorless. It provides what you need to stay alive, but there's no enjoyment in it. It's like eating rice crackers for the rest of your life. Okay, there's a, there's a question of uh, Nanette. I don't know if you can read it. Oh, it's kind of the same project. Yeah. Wanted to ask if you still use or work with conventional forms of representation like floor plans or so, or if you find it useless in projects. It's interesting you mentioned that. I have my my book here, uh, one of our the books on our work. And I just wanted to show you like one of the sections I drew, you know, hand drew like Beaux Arts right. style 20 years ago with a pencil. Like <laughs> I love That's a good cycle. Yeah, I love a good section. And we're always, you know, there is a lot in our books about like things I didn't show. You know, you can't see them very well here, but even plans and sections yeah. of our Helsinki Guggenheim, you know, like realistic floor plans. So it's all there. But again, the force of the argument, especially for uh, purposes of, you know, academia and presenting to architects, that you only have so much time in a lecture. So we're really foreground the visual aspects of our work, the perceivable visual aspects of our work. But you should, you know, I've been teaching st uh, studios at Yale for 20 years, and I only let them do plans, sections, elevations, and perspectives. Like, I don't want any stupid diagrams with arrows that turn architecture into cartoons for children. I think architecture should be complex. I don't think you can understand it with a, you know, a Bjark Ingels diagram in two seconds. It frankly like pisses me off that people think architecture can be simplified into a cartoon so that a four-year-old can understand it. That's that's not the power of architecture. I think the power of architecture is in its complexity, its cultural value, its meaning. And I don't think you can diagram cultural value and meaning with a little arrow. So I'm like wholly against anything that turns architectural viewers into children which is why we refuse to do diagrams. Like I'll write books about my work and essays about my work, but you'll very rarely see 
a kind of infantilizing diagram about my work. I just think if architecture is in the building, in, is in the business of treating humanity as stupid, and we're responsible for creating the background of human reality, we're gonna be creating stupid humans. I really think it's that simple. Uh, if architecture yeah. doesn't have the ability to engage with more difficult problems. Yeah, of course. Well, I, I was, now that you show those, uh, those plans, um, I don't know, I was thinking that um, maybe there's also, you were we were talking about how we can show reality, right? So we are choosing a way to to show uh, reality in, in, in certain way, right? You're you're using perspective and sometimes axonometrics. Um, I don't know, maybe the uh, well, you use some kind sometimes facades like plain renderings, right? That's all. That's Almost the plan, almost. Yeah. Right. Like in the like the tower. No, it's that not you like show, I, said, I do. I do it. We just you know we we tend to foreground the the more visually impactful aspects of our yeah. work on our website in in lectures and things. Like I said, that doesn't mean the projects don't have planned sections and elevations. And sometimes right. we show them, and sometimes we don't. It's just I I, I think. People have mistaken, or there's a kind of fetishization of plan in architecture. And Le Corbusier, of course, said the plan is the generator. Like the plan is a tool to let you organize architecture into something more powerful than just function, more meaningful than just efficiency. Yeah. So the plan is a tool to get to architecture. The plan is not architecture, which I, you know, have plenty of debates with people, but. I, you know, I'm probably the most, uh, you know, plan specific architect. <laughs> I mean, we just draw tons and tons of plans, but that's, right. it's only a tool to get to a reality of architecture. I don't think we should fetishize our plans in the same way. I don't think we should turn our, our architectural projects into pastel cartoons that look pretty for right whatever reasons, you know, paintings on a wall or posters or. Yeah, patronizing intentions. Right. Patronizing, yeah, I think it's patronizing. Yeah. Well, and I think actually, uh, I think actually, you know, if you do a beautiful and meaningful building, it actually reaches more people by being, by, by, by pulling on some aspect of their humanity than just putting a dumb diagram of it online that only architecture students enjoy. You know. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, well, there, uh, there, we have a, a raised hand. Uh, sure. You can open your mic if you like. Oh, hello. Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the interesting uh, presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, this. Maybe an, an, an old-fashioned question. Um, it was a topic maybe ten or fifteen years ago. The topic is control. Um, I know you haven't mentioned the, the word control, or I don't know if you're even interested in the topic. Um, but um, could you elaborate a bit about how do you come to the sure. maybe the final organization of your projects? Um, because on, on the first they look quite sculptural, uh, especially the Guggenheim or these experiments with kit bashing, um, and in the end when you brought uh, artificial intelligence, uh, it's another sort of uh, black box, which... Yep. Yeah, that's yeah. An, it's an easy question, actually, believe it or not, that uh, I, I have no interest whatsoever in architecture produced without humans. <laughs> uh, everything we do is composed by a human being. All the tools we use are controlled by human beings. Uh, there's a funny, I mean, I do a lot of theory about aesthetics and beauty, and there's an interesting theory in beauty that I tend to believe in my office, that if I tell you to produce something beautiful, you can't do it. Like, no human can do it. But humans aren't very good at producing beauty, but we're incredible at judging beauty. So if I show you a lineup of 50 people, you'd be able to pick out, the, let's say, the three most beautiful people, according to you. 
And those would generally line up across human culture based on studies that most people pick the same three or four people. Of course, some people have different tastes, some beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but generally people agree. Same is true if I put 50 cars in front of everyone here listening. You know, generally consensus is going to gather around a certain number of cars. It's because if I show you 10 things, everyone will have their own opinion on what's their own what's the most beautiful. So what we do in our office is we just produce hundreds of iterations of something. So when we do an AI-based project, we'll generate 100 facades and we'll sit around in the office and talk about which ones we like and why and why they have that impact, what qualities we like about them. Then we might go back and adjust the AI and try to get more of those qualities out of it. But it's just about doing it multiple times, judging it, doing it again, judging it, doing it again, judging it. And in that sense, it's all about composition and aesthetic judgment, that we stop designing when we have the aesthetic effects we like. And there's no other criteria. There's no emergent program. There's no grasshopper script. There's nothing that tells us when our projects are done. We agree as an office when our projects are done. So total control, like micro control. Uh, that doesn't mean we have control over the tools. You know, sometimes AIs do really crazy weird things that we don't expect, which is one of the reasons we love them. But then we'll learn why it did that and try to get it to do more of that and use that. So unexpected surprises are very much a part of what we do. We just try to learn from them and develop an expertise with them. So I don't use the word control. I use the word expertise that... Uh, you don't always have control over what you do, but if you work with a tool long enough, you will develop a kind of expertise about it. I would say that the Helsinki Guggenheim was one of the first projects we did with kit bashing. I think it's hideously ugly, and I probably would have been embarrassed had it been built. Uh, it's because we didn't have any expertise, right? Like, we, it was the first time we had tried something. It was this big, lumpy mess that has, like, you know, toasters and alligators and Thor's hammer and like all this weird shit in it. You know, it's a very amateur project that I'm, you know, I look back now and it's like, oh my God, it's so bad. But I think that project helped us develop higher degrees of expertise. And not to compare myself with Brunelleschi, but Brunelleschi, when he's in 14, 19, when he started playing with classicism, uh, Brunelleschi lost the competition to do the baptistry doors in Florence in 1408. So he went with his best friend Donatello, the sculptor, not the Ninja Turtle, to Rome for a year to sketch the Roman ruins. So he learned about all about classicism, about the Roman ruins, and brought that information back to Florence. Rome was abandoned. It was just this weird ruined city that no one lived in. But he brought back all this information about classical architecture, and he tried to use it in Florence. And when he did the Pazzi Chapel around 1420, in terms of classical architecture, it's a terrible building, but it was the first building of the Renaissance, which makes it super important. And over his career and the career of the Renaissance, the buildings got better and better because they developed higher and higher degrees of expertise. So I think all of the things we're playing with now We've developed more expertise, but I would expect that the expertise probably wouldn't get really fantastic for a couple hundred years. I mean, classical architecture in the Renaissance took 300 years to get from Brunelleschi to Borromini. So I would expect that working with higher level resolutions of detail would take 300 years to get to you know someone who's really good at it. We're the first, but that just means we're the worst. <laughs> so everything I've shown you is just bad examples of a better future yet to come. Uh, I have a follow-up question then. Um, uh, how do you train your 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 staff, your collaborators in in this idea of beauty that you you pursue, or at least um, how do you agree with your collaborators in this idea of beauty that you mentioned? Well. Uh, I don't think you have to train people. I think people know. I mean, you will get, there have been a lot of studies on beauty. You will get variation in a population and what they think is beautiful. But more often than not, there's a lot more consensus than there is variation. So human beings tend to prefer similar things. And that changes from culture to culture, but that doesn't change that dramatically. And there's some giveaways, like about aesthetic reactions that are embedded in humankind. 
in any culture on earth, when a human talks to a baby, they get their face closer and they raise their voice and they talk like an idiot and da 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 and boo 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 boo. Like every culture on earth does that without being taught to do it. Every culture on earth, when you smell something rotten, you'll like wrinkle up your nose and make a face because there's some ingrained response, aesthetic response to stimulus in the real world that we have. And over, you know, either 50,000 or a million years of human evolution, we've evolved as any species have evolved to kind of be drawn to certain things. There's again, cultural differences, but our cultures are all maybe a couple thousand years old. Our evolutionary development and biology is, you know, technically several million years old. So there is something ingrained that you don't need to train. And if we have different ideas about what's impactful in the office, we actually discuss it and like talk about it and argue about it. So it just makes us talk more about the thing and wonder more about it and be curious about it. And which in turns makes us more engaged with it than just doing a building and judging it based on adjective criteria like efficiency or cost or whatever. I don't think there's that. I guess the end result is that, you know, it doesn't take a lot of training. And I just tend to people hire, hire people I think have a good eye just based on their portfolios. I mean, anyone who's ever opened portfolios of other people, you know within five or 10 seconds if you have a good one or not. Thank you. You can send me your portfolio, I'll show you. <laughs> 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 well, I can. I, we have another question, but I can. I, I can uh, ask something related. That is, uh, you say that you, you you take your decisions according to discussions and aesthetic values that you have, but I believe that there is also a dialogue with history and lineage of architecture in your in your designs. What is what is the place for that? I mean, you work a lot with symmetry and unity of the of the work and uh you work with circulations and composition uh, with which uh, lineage of architects do you feel more comfortable talking with yeah basically any architect that wasn't in the 20th century <laughs> <laughs> for fifty thousand years up until about 1900 architects almost exclusively worked with symmetry and then modernism happened and asymmetry became the kind of name of the game and because most of our professors and our professors professors and our professors 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 were trained within the modern uh uh milieu there's still this kind of reaction against why would you ever do a symmetrical building but you know i tend to date symmetrical people you know yeah I tend to have symmetrical pets. <laughs> my chairs tend to be symmetrical. My microphone is symmetrical. My water bottle is symmetrical. My mouse is symmetrical. My computer monitor is symmetrical. It's amazing how symmetrical, how comfortable you are with symmetry in your life, except when it comes to architecture, when it's this like, oh my God, who's the crazy guy doing symmetry? <laughs> I also had a professor once, because I was educated as a classical architect, he said, always do symmetrical buildings because then you only have to design half a building. Yeah, so there, there's that. I heard that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we have a question here. Uh, I don't know if you can read it or I can read it. Uh, do you think your ideas about the need of visual or aesthetic complexity could be extrapolated to some other aspect of architecture, like trying to achieve functional complexity to go along i tend to feel that we are not only living in visually dull buildings but also functionally dull and outdated ones yes absolutely you know it's it's uh that's why i think floor plans are a little bit hilarious um it, it takes a lot of like balls for an architect to like spend a hundred million dollars and tell humans that they can only like eat here in the cafe and they can only read here in the library and you know they can only relax in the living room like you know it's just preposterously simplistic in its thinking like still today we have a food room 
in a house, you have a poop room, you have a sleep room, and you have a sit around room, right? But you don't always do those things in those same rooms. You eat food in the living room or the sleep room. You sleep in the living room. I hope you don't poop in the food room, but you know, generally complexity in it happens. Uh, our, it does happen. It, it happens. But <laughs> our idea of program is so stupid. It's so outdated. And when we do these complex arrangements of program, they almost never survive reality. So if you go into any building that's 10 years old, my guess is that people are using rooms for reasons other than their intended purposes by architects. I mean, I think people use, and I don't think people use rooms as specifically as architects think they do. Yeah, I would actually rather produce, I mean, I actually think architects just get a little too excited about dividing up rooms into, into different uses. I'm much more interested in like regions and areas than splitting up little rooms. You know, or even like a place like Versailles, you know, there wasn't really a big distinction between people where ate and where they slept. You know, I mean, it's gross, but people pooped and peed in the hallways. Yeah. Like of Versailles, it was like, it's funny. It like didn't have like library, cafeteria, you know, if you designed Versailles today, it would be just like absurd. Sitting room, astronomy room. I think program has a lot of room, a lot of room for innovation. So Gabriel asked the question. So I think it's you get to dedicate your career to interesting program or interesting ways of thinking about program. Well, but the way that you uh, arrange ornament uh, in the inside, well, you, you were showing this uh, perspective section of this late work that you show. Uh, in a sense, ornamentation is kind of uh, organizing or kind of uh, suggesting some kind of I way of I, uh, I never use the word ornament because I think it it implies just historically in architecture that it's something that's just stuck on after the architecture is done. Yeah. And I like to think of resolution as something that's integral to the architecture. So you can't remove resolution from our work. You could re remove ornament from a work. And I think that's why Adolf Loos thought ornament was a crime because it's this like frilly feminine thing that you paste on a building, which is why it's so criticized. But for instance, I think of it more like a blanket, like you weave a blanket and it has a pattern in it. You can't remove the pattern, right? Without removing the blanket, without unraveling the blanket. Whereas if you have a cake and you're just sticking on candles, and putting on frosted flowers, you can take those off and you still have a cake. So I think what we do is hopefully not ornamental. It's more like engaged, but I do think resolution and aesthetics can certainly clue you in how to use certain rooms. I know, you know, as a fact that at Yale, uh, we have some really beautiful rooms from the 19th century uh, that are just you know, beautiful tall ceiling, beautiful chandelier, beautiful furniture, students study in those rooms, really good behavior. And then we have like library spaces that are underground and seven feet tall, and there's shitty little cubicles. And the students trash those areas, you know, they leave McDonald's wrappers and they throw spitballs at each other and they have sex. And it's just, it's disgusting down in those subterranean library rooms. But I think you get much better behavior in the rooms that are more civil and more beautiful. And I think that's because the architecture informs you on how to behave to some degree. And there's no sign that says no food, no drinking. It's just your behavior tends to be elevated when you're, I think, in a more humane environment. And it doesn't mean it has to be more expensive, but I, I do think there's... I do think there's something to that. And I do think, you know, the worst behavior in America in public is in our Walmarts where we have sales and people literally pull their each other's hair out to get to the cheapest TV. It's because you're in like a giant warehouse. There's nothing civil or humane about the architecture of a Walmart. But you go into, you know, a beautiful bookstore and people aren't pulling each other's hair out to get cheaper, 
cheaper books. <laughs> yeah, well, that that could be a an, uh, uh, a take on a more complex function, right? Or functionalism, like architecture is talking about not what to do there, or <clears throat> but how to do it or how yeah. to behave. That's nice. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I don't know if we have any more questions. I don't want to take you all your time. It's great that you take the time to do this on a Friday night. Uh, we're usually wasted by, by now. Uh, <laughs> so thank you very much uh, for doing this, Mark. I have a great time. Um, you guys all go out and get wasted. <laughs> OK, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, we hope to do this again sometime. All right, Thank great. You. Can you all go